Boa tarde. Bem-vindas, bem-vindos, Arlan Wassarlan. Hoje nós vamos fazer uma conversa aqui super especial com a autora de Gente, Isso é Londres. É, essa transmissão será em inglês, né? mas em breve nós teremos o um vídeo legendado aqui no nosso canal. Né? Então aproveitem já, quem não está inscrito no canal da Tabla, é, se inscreve, deixa o like nesse vídeo. E é, para seguir também as, novas, as nossas novidades, o que tem para acontecer de conversas com vários autores que têm sido publicados pela editora. É, então, vamos começar, né? So, welcome everyone to this uh, very special transmission. I'm Felipe Benjamin, and this is an initiative of, ta of Tabla. Uh, Tabla is the first Brazilian publishing house specialized in Arabic literature translated into Portuguese. And our guest today is Hanana Sheikh, author of Inaha London Yazizi, just launched by Tabla as Gente Isso é Londres, and translated from Arabic into Portuguese by uh, Jemima Alves. Yeah. Hanan al-Sheikh uh, is considered one of the most important figures in modern Arabic fiction, with her works translated into 21 languages. Lebanese Hanan belongs to the same generation of well-known names such as Huda Barakat, Iman Humaydan, Elias Khoury, Rashid Daif, who had their writing much affected by the atrocities of the Lebanese civil war, uh, which took place from 1975 to 1990. All of them were translated into Portuguese and published by Tabla. It's worth to mention uh, that uh, although Inna Halandani Azizi is Hanan's first novel to be translated into Portuguese, samples of her work had been translated before and published in academic journals in Brazil, such as her short stories, A Suje de la Ajamia, O Tapete Persa, a collective translation by the Tarjama Group of the University of São Paulo, And La Yambari and Yari Farajul Biheda, O Homem Não Deve Saber Disso, by Jemima Alves. Uh, the links for this text can be found here in the chat, so you can uh, take a look at, uh, at these uh, texts in Portuguese. So let's start now. Welcome, Hanan. It's a pleasure to have you here today, directly from London. Eh? Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you. I'm, I'm very excited about it. Thank you. Uh, thank you again. And I also welcome uh, my colleague, Jemima Alves, who did an amazing job with the translation of Ina Haland and Yaziz into Portuguese, and is joining us today from New York. Nice to have you here, Jemima. Yeah. Thank you very much, Philippe. I'm very excited to participate in this conversation. And thank you, Hanan, for being thank here. for translating. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for me on this book. Yeah. <laughs> my pleasure. So uh, I will start with the first question, Hanan. And about the, the theme of, uh, uh, of migration and exile to some extent. Né? Uh, I see that this theme of migration uh, seems to have become more and more present throughout your work. As we can see, not only in, in only London, né? which talks about the trajectory of characters from different Arab countries with a common destination, London, né? But as well for your latest novel, Aina Taus, The Peacock Sky, né? which had just been released by, by that lab, né? and, which, and which touches, among other things, on the lives of uh, Arab immigrants moving from Germany to France. Né? So uh, I would say it, it's very difficult not to draw né? a parallel between the fiction, like the book Only in London, and your personal trajectory as a Lebanese national living in London. Né? So could you tell us what led you to leave Lebanon and decide to move to London, and how this movement from uh, east to west relates to your trajectory as a writer in terms of the, the things né, that appears in your novels, like the question of identity, for example. Né? So uh, feel free to... 19, 1975, um, the civil war start, started in Lebanon, and I had two children, My daughter, Juman, was seven months old, and my son, Tariq, was two uh, years and a half. And, um, you know, the civil war started, and it was all right the first uh, one, one month or two months. And then sniping started, and I was so scared of snipers. 
And I couldn't believe that there was someone perched on uh, top of a building and killing people. It is not between two armies, not between two militias, but someone, a solitary, solitary uh, man doing that. I was uh, very scared. I thought, oh, my God, maybe when I go to, to buy some milk for my children, I'll be killed. What about my, my two children? And this is when I became obsessed that I don't want to go out from, um, from the house. And I was really scared. And I used to have a beautiful cactus. It never, never bloomed. And one day during this um, atrocity and violence, I saw a beautiful yellow flower of the cactus. I couldn't believe it. I looked at it. I took the pot between my two hands and I said, thank you. You are telling me to leave because there is life far away from violence. There is a life, a beautiful life outside Lebanon. And this is when I decided to take my children and leave. And I came to London because I love London. And my husband was working. Um, he had to to leave Lebanon. He was an engineer and look for a job somewhere else. And this is what I did. 1975, I left Lebanon. And Hanan, and do you think that um, do you see a difference when you in the in the in the, the themes of your literature of your works when you were you were writing? living in the Arab countries and when you start, started writing, living in London? The, the, yeah, it changed. Because usually I'm always inspired by my life, inspired by the life around me. For example, my previous two novels, um, uh, Suicide of a Dead Man, it was about a love story and it was based on me and someone else whom I was in love with. And The Praying Mantis, it was about the way I was brought up in Lebanon by a pious father, religious pious father. So I'm always inspired by, by my thoughts and my, by my feelings and the, um, the environment around me. So when I left Lebanon to London, this is when I felt that I need to write something uh, because I left Lebanon because I wanted to stay alive and to write and express my feelings. And this is what I, uh, I wrote story of Zahra before. It's about snipers and the civil war and yeah. I'm always, always, inspired by everything around me. Amazing. And uh, so, Jemima, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, if you have a question to Hanan, you're, you're muted. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, my question goes like straightforward to the book because uh, yeah, I had like uh, a relationship with this book I wrote uh, in my dissertation, my master dis dissertation, I wrote about this book, and then I was invited um, to translate for Tabla. So, Hanan, when you read, like, In uh, London Azizi, or Only in London, or Gente, Isa Londres, we think this novel is only about those four characters Amira, Lamise, Nicholas, and Samir. But at some point, we realize that London is also a character presenting itself to, in various ways to these characters. So what's the role that London plays in this novel? Yes. Um, London is a character, a, let's say a woman or a man, saying to all these foreigners, you are most welcome. Show us who you are. How are you going to live with me. Tell me about you. Tell me how you feel about me. There is a rapport between you and me. 
And you're right, uh, London became a character, one very important character in my novel. It depends on the, uh, the area, the neighborhood. It depends about the character, who is this ca the character. But all in all, the most important thing, London gives freedom, freedom to recreate yourself. Whoever you want, you want to be, you can be in London because nobody knows your past. Nobody even knows your future or your present. You can be whatever you want. Like um, Amira, she thought, oh, I want to uh, think that I, I want to uh, imagine or make believe that, that I am a princess. And she started to behave like a princess. Of course, she wanted um, to con other people, uh, especially men, to get money and to, you know, she was a high class prostitute. And um, Lamise, who is from Iraq, and also she was in London, and the way she felt that London is, is really liberating her, she, she can be herself. That's why she, she divorced her husband and she became, you know, very strong. So we have Amira, we have Lemis, and we have Samir, the, co the comic Samir. Also, Samir, he said, I'm not going to be camouflaged that I, uh, I, although I was forced to be married and have children, I have five children because I didn't want to say that I'm attracted to the same sex. I am gay, but London is so big and London is so free and London has a big heart. I can be whatever I want. Yes. And then Noor was also doing the way she is, you know, living as well. Yeah. Regardless of how she, uh, her life would be, she, also she was very, very open. And Nicholas, uh, he is a uh, English who is watching all of these characters and and be was with them as well. Uh, now that you started the talk talking about the book, I I have a question that is for both of you, for Hanan and, and Jemima, uh, regarding the, the language of the text. As, as you mentioned, so we have these characters from different parts of the, of the Arab world. So when we read the, the original text, we have like this, all these linguistic layers uh, that you work, Hanan, with like the Iraqi Arabic or dialect, the Gulf Arabic, uh, Moroccan Arabic, yeah. Lebanese Arabic, and it's it happens all the time uh, in dialogues and side by side with the standard or the literary Arabic. Yeah? Uh, so I would like to ask to Hanan about this. Uh, what's the function of using uh, the dialect in literature? Yeah. Yeah? And to Jemima, what was the challenge of translating this uh, plurality of, uh, of voices né, in different dialects yes. into Portuguese? Né? Yeah. Well, um, since I was a child, I remember when the teacher used to give us composition to write, uh, always the dialogue I used to write in the colloquial Arabic. And the teacher would say, no, no, no. What are you doing? You can't. I say, but people don't talk like that, teacher. They don't say, they'll say, اليوم? And I don't like to, to be pretending. She said, no, you can't. You have to have classical Arabic, uh, formal Arabic in everything. But I couldn't. In all my work, even starting from the, uh, the praying mantis, all the dialogues have to be in dialect, not, not classical, because it is, it is nearer to the heart and also to the mind. So when I, I was writing, I say, 
I can't, the Moroccan has to write Moroccan, the Lebanese has to talk in Lebanese, etc., etc. So this is what I insisted that each one has, um, each character has his or her own dialect. And I know that translators didn't like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I, I needed, because this is my style. I cannot force myself uh, otherwise. I have to be truthful to my style and to myself. And I'm always do that until now. Sometimes I, whenever I need to say something very profoundly and at the spur of the moment, I found myself talking in dialect. And you, Jamima, uh, how did you tackle the difficulty or this challenge? Yeah, it was like a challenge <laughs> to translate, to understand, I think, at first, because uh, as Hanan was saying, uh, the dialect in there plays a really important uh, role because it's about like the character. I mean, when Amira speaks, she's Moroccan, but she always speaks in Egyptian because she chooses. She feels like more comfortable speaking in Egyptian. Mm -hmm. So the dialect is part of the character. When Samir is like speaking in uh, Lebanese or uh, Lamise speaks like in Iraq with her father, we feel that there is something there. Uh, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, when we translate, we lose this colorful. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's it's complicated for us. We try to imagine how this person would speak like in Portuguese, uh, mm -hmm. but then something is missing there. Something from their personalities, because language is really, really related to personality. So. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for me, it was really, really hard to <laughs> write like in Portuguese and see all these colors uh, of the, the Arab dialects missing my final text. But how did you understand them? Did you talk to an Iraqi? Did you talk to a, someone from the Gulf? I mean, how, how did you figure it out? Yeah. As I, I lived in Oman at some point, and they ah. kind of understand and they helped me. I had like a, a tutor from Iraq uh, yeah. who helped me. But yeah, I think the most difficult part is understanding the expressions. I mean, the cultural expressions are yes. the most challenging thing yes. in, in this book. And yes. you explored uh, in. <laughs> Iraqi and Egyptian and Lebanese. I mean, uh, it was uh, it was difficult, but it was like really, really a beautiful uh, experience for me as a first job. No, it yeah. was like, yeah, unforgettable. It was your first. It was like my first book. Yeah. Oh my God! Congratulations! <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, in, uh, Egyptian uh, and Egyptian was so, uh, it wasn't difficult for me because I lived in Egypt when I was 18 years old. But mm -hmm. the other, I used to ask uh, Iraqis and others, yeah, in the Gulf. The Gulf, I knew, I, I got, had idea because I lived there as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. So, Hanan, um, when we read this novel, we cannot, uh, I mean, we cannot read it without recognizing some Orientalism criticism from Edward Said hovering on its page. Well, uh, if the narrator's descriptions or the characters speak, we can, like, catch this criticism. So how relevant is still is this theory to describe the current situation of the Arab world, its relationship with the global North countries, and the perspectives Arab people have about themselves? Well, I didn't think about it the way you are <laughs> analyzing it. I just, 
I, I, I don't think of theories when I write, not at all. A fiction writer, a writer would uh, get uh, close to the characters, um, uh, giving birth to characters and not, not to ideas and not to intellectual ideas. But of course, you know, um, one, the, the reader has to apply or to think uh, whatever you, you thought about Orientalism. Uh, I mean, one, uh, let us suppose um, an English uh, person, man or woman, came to live in Lebanon. I don't think there is something about Orientalism or Westerners or anything. It is just, it happened, this character lived in Lebanon or my characters are you know, of the of the novel, um, were living in in England, in London itself. So it is the reader who comes to the uh, text. Yeah, this is this is my answer. You're not satisfied. <laughs> no, I am. I am. But I mean, uh, I think when I read the first time, uh, I felt like. Uh, I mean, the narrator seems for me very aware of this criticism. I mean, maybe you didn't think about it, but not at all. Yeah, not I mean, but but it's yeah. but it's new. I mean, in your background, and then uh, it's there. I mean, we see like how uh, how the narrator like think Nicholas and think about like the British people or how uh, Lamise, she, uh, she posed herself against like all the ideas Nicholas has about like Middle East or about like uh, Oman and Arab people. And I mean, maybe, Nic maybe Nicholas thought so, but in their relationship, I don't think there was any Orientalism in that. Yeah because they were, both of them, they weren't sure how to deal with each other, <laughs> which, with, uh, with each other. Uh, yeah, this is, this is how, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't feel there is the Orientalism issue in, uh, in that novel, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting that Nicholas, uh, he has like a, I like his, his character, this character because he he be, when we meet Europeans who are interested in in the Middle East or in Arabic, uh, many of them behave just like Nicholas. Né? So when he, yeah. Yeah. When, so they are always like they know more about they they think they know more about. The Arabs, then the Arabs, then the Arabs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, for example, when he's with um, with uh, with Lamise, né? Uh, he he takes her to a party with his friends, and she is talking to people who visited the Middle, uh, visited the Iraq, and speak Arabic, but speak classical Arabic or standard <laughs> Arabic, and she starts speaking in her dialect, and the the guests say. No, no, this is dialect. This is not uh, Arabic. This know, is not like, Arabic. Yeah, yeah, it's not the correct form. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The superiority, yeah. Né, of yeah. The, and, like, we, we, we are Orientalists. Orientalists, I, I mean, like uh, Oriental or yeah. Arabists, and we know yeah, more and, about Arabic than you. Sure, sure. And another part for me that uh, it was really interesting, it was Lamise telling, Nicholas was inviting Lamise to go to Oman, and she said, like, no, we cannot go and stay together in the same hotel because yeah. I'm an Arab person. I mean, they would know, yes. Yeah, I cannot. And then he said, like, no, but you, you have, like, a British passport. You can go. Yes. And then she said, like, I have, like, an Arab name. And then she said, like, Nicholas, you want to know more about Arab people than I know. Yeah. Yes. And then he said, like, no, I mean, and she said, like, I know uh, he didn't know. Are, like, Arab people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, he didn't know that, uh, he thought that, yeah, having a British passport, that's it. 
yeah yeah regardless of the name or uh, yeah it doesn't matter if you are arab or not criticized to be with an Eng uh, with an english man and everything yeah yeah so this is this i'm, for so, me. I'm so happy you decided to uh, to discuss it with me because i reread it i haven't read it for so many years <laughs> really <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I don't reread my work except when I need to. I said, "Oh my God!" Mm. And how was this experience of Maybe visiting I... these characters again? I mean, yes, I thought they were very well drawn, <laughs> and, and um, I, I really liked them. And I thought, "Oh, I had lots of patience." I, I was very patient when I was reading, uh, when, when I was writing, and uh, I, I loved also some um, images I, uh, I used uh, in the text. Yeah, no, I, I really liked it. <laughs> and and Hanan. Uh... Regarding this, these characters, now when we, we talk about or we see Samir, that is the Lebanese a char character of the book. Yes. Um, I was reading that book by uh, Joseph Massad. Ah, yes. Arabs. Yeah. And he talks about uh, your book, uh, Miss Kalrazel. Yes. That it's uh, in English has another uh, name. No? Women, women of Sand and Myrrh. Yeah, like the deer's the deer's musk, and but in English they did a, a version. Yeah. yeah. And and jo, and and Masad, he he says in in his book that you were one of the the pioneers in dealing with these non normative uh, sexuality, né? like exploring like ho homosexual relations uh, in literature, especially in that period of. In the mm -hmm. 80s when it was not so common and at the same time in the world we had like uh, the the rise of a conservatorism and uh, yes. yeah. the Arab countries so touch for example touching in in things like uh, AIDS also so uh, I remember that you you have a character in the Miss Kalrazel that is Suha, né? that she's a Lebanese living in, in the Gulf. In the Gulf. Let's and say in Saudi Arabia. In, uh, yeah, in the Saudi Arabia. Yeah, exactly. I, I didn't, uh, when I wrote Miskil Ghazal, uh, I didn't try it. Uh, it was Saudi Arabia, but it oh. was inspired by Saudi Arabia. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I thought only the Gulf I wrote then. Yeah, but it is Saudi Arabia. And then, um, and like, uh, and she has like a, a relationship, a, a, a relationship with a, lesbian another relationship, woman, yeah. a lesbian relationship. Yeah. So I would like to to ask you, um, why do you think it's important to bring this, like, uh, sexuality yeah. into your literature, into yes. your work? Is it related to? to this conflict between modernity and tradition in the Arab countries? What, what do you think about that? Again, I tell you that I don't think of these theories. I'm inspired by my surroundings, by the life around me, and by my thoughts and by everything around me. Um, in Ms. Um, Ghazal, for example, Women of Sand and Myrrh, when I lived in Saudi Arabia, I thought, oh God, I went to a, uh, a wedding at night and I thought, I felt that there were so many women attracted to each other. It's because of the closed society. I'm talking about um, mid seventies, early eighties. Uh, so women confined with each other felt at ease with each other, and many fell in love with each other. So this is my, this is, as a writer, it was amazing to, to because in Lebanon, I, I never saw that. Yeah. So it was something new. And uh, as a writer, I jumped uh, on this thought, and I said, it's amazing that two women will, will love each other. 
before Miskil Ghazal, my first novel, uh, Suicide of a Dead Man, it's not translated. It was about an old man who is in love with a younger girl. And I talked in it about impotence, that he was very uh, older than her and he didn't know how to make love to her or he didn't know how or whatever so uh, and at that time I remember the uh, the um, Darren Nahar and Nasher which published me the um, the editor said Hanan why are you talking about input <laughs> I said well why not I don't know why this is my character I, I don't have any taboos Whatever I think of, I write. Whatever I'm inspired about, I write. So in The Women of Sand and Myrrh, I didn't think, oh, I shouldn't be talking about uh, this relationship, lesbian relationship between the two women. But then I said, why? This is what I was inspired. I saw what was going on. And of course, these women are very um, closed in with each other most of them they don't they don't they don't mix with men so they bound to have a lesbian relationship with with each other and yeah and uh, samir also um why why don't i uh, why should i not write about this character. I couldn't believe when I, I met someone like him. He had five children. It, it was so funny. I was walking in Edgeware Road uh, because Edgeware Road, they have many Lebanese uh, and Arab uh, shops, especially food and everything. And all of a sudden, I see a man imitating me, uh, the way I was uh, dressing and walking like, he thought I was existentialist, and he came to me and he said, oh, I am Mujudiya, existentialist. I'm Hanan Sheikh. I'm existentialist. And I looked at him. I said, who are you? He said, I am, I am, what shall I say? I'm not going to say I'm Samir and not Samira. I'm not Dada. I'm not Dada. And then we sat and we started talking with each other and I loved his character. And I thought, I want to know him more. And I, he started taking me around, taking me around to parties, to Lebanese, to, yeah. And I wrote, and uh, this is how uh, his character was born. So why not? Why shouldn't I? This is, this is what life is about. There are so many things. There are sniping, snipers, there are princesses, there are, there are poor people, uh, decadent people, uh, tr truthful people, philosopher. One, writers, you know, can write about anything, anything. They use character, they use the originality as well. And, and Hanan, do you think that... Uh... Uh, bringing these uh, moral themes uh, like uh, like masturbation or like this this uh, these subjects do you think that uh, how is the reception of that for example uh, among the the arab readers yes i i think they take it because uh, I remember one time I asked someone, uh, a student, why, why don't you, why do you take it? I mean, why do you believe, uh, why do you not revolt against it and say, oh, why do you write something like that? And she was veiled. She said, because you're honest. I see honesty. And she is right. Because I don't use it. I don't use these characters only to make a propaganda for myself and, uh, you know, I want to shock. No, these characters, I go inside them. It's not only, I don't stay at the superficial level. That's it. 
she was right. It's honesty. It's honest what I do. Because this is a society. It has everything. And, you know, I think now at my age, I sometimes I ask myself, why am I like that? I think it also goes back to my childhood. My mother left my father when I was five years old. She fell in love with another man, but uh, she was forced to marry my father when she was 14 years old. My father was much older than her. So she left home. I was five years old and nobody was looking after me. Uh, I mean, to bring me up the right way. So in a way, I was all involved with myself, with my thoughts, with my imagination. So I was free in a way. No mother at home around me to tell me do this, do not to do that. I had a horrible stepmother who I didn't relate to. I hated her. And my father was as if married to God. He was very pious, very religious, lovely man. But he wasn't living uh, in, in, uh, in life itself. He was living with after life. Yeah, he was very, very, very pious. So in a way, I was, I was totally alone, in a way, which made me think, which made me think and, and feel that I am free and I, uh, I am the one who is looking after me. And whatever I think, it has to be right. <laughs> Jemima, do you want to, to, to make a question? Yeah. And then, given your significant experience as a novelist and intellectual who has lived in Europe for such a long time, how do you describe the status of Arabic literature in the mm -hmm. context of transnational literature? Do you okay. think... Arabic literature today has an audience that appreciates the narratives, or are the readers still moved by curiosity of the mysterious Orient and the exotic? Um, well, I'll tell you uh, the, the first thing. Could you could you repeat the question? Yeah, the, of course. I mean, okay, I'm sorry. So, do you think nowadays uh, we have like? Uh, an audience that appreciates uh, the narratives, oh, the Arabic yes. narratives. Yes. yes, yeah. I mean, how is the, the context of Arabic literature in the yes, yeah, transnational literature? Yeah, I tell you, um, it is uh, it is not like Orientalism or they think you know they they are many followers to the Arabic literature. Uh, because uh, they uh, uh, they read, you know, because of the media as well, and maybe let's say Najib Mahfouz, the mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for example, Najib Mahfouz had a followers, Tayyip Saleh, um, many many um, Arab authors. And it is not that they talk about uh, uh, Orientalism or uh, mm -hmm. the, the, ing the, um, the foreigner reader wants to be uh, uh, to to have a glimpse on the Arab world or no they they are interested in lit literature itself mm -hmm. and so many varieties of subjects the wars, uh, uh, not only traditions, but wars and conflicts, uh, um, uh, philosophy, so many things, yeah. And, uh, and uh, also colonialism, all of these subjects draw the attention of foreign readers, especially if... Uh, they they discover one writer and they like this like Najib Mahfouz and they they follow all the time this writer or it's not not only because like people thought you know oh they like 
let us say Hanan al-Sheikh because she's uh, very courageous and she talked about you know sexuality or something. I don't think that's this is the only thing. Only because they want to know how the Arabs live or whatever. No, they consider it a novel. Okay. They, yeah, they are reading a complete novel, interesting novels. And this is how I feel nowadays. Great, great. Yeah, now I feel nowadays they really are, there are followers who are interested in Arabic novels, not because of veils or womanhood or, yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Hanan, do you think that uh, publishers, the publishing houses yeah. in, in the West, they have a preference for, for novels that touch on this? On, on taboos or, or, for example, on sexual repression or the situation of the woman in the Arab world? Do you think that there is a policy or... Uh, I, I don't, yes, yeah, I know what you, you're saying. I, I don't think so. Maybe one book or something, but this is not their aim. This is not what they do. Like, for example, I have to tell you how I was translated. Mm -hmm. Story of Zahra, when I wrote Story of Zahra in Lebanon, uh, it was banned from the Arab countries. Uh, I went to nine publishers. Nobody wanted to publish it. And I remember going to a friend of mine who used to publish children books. And I remember I held the manuscript. I said, you know what? This is the ninth publisher who said that he, they don't want to publish it. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to throw it from the window. So all the people, uh, the, the, the people who are walking around and about, each one will take one page. It's enough for me that they read it. She said, you are so stupid. She closed the window and she said, we are going to publish it, you and me. We are publishing story of Zahra. And this is what we did. Okay. The Institut de Monde Arabe, have you heard of it? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. The Monde Arabe, see. yeah, the Institut de Monde Arabe. They, because they, um, after they, they, they want the opening, they thought we want to have 10, 10 novels, Arabic novels, which talk about everything in the Arab world. It will, and they chose one of them, the story of Zahra. It was still in Arabic, no, no translation, nothing. And people couldn't believe it. Najib Mahfouz, Tayyip Saleh, all these, you know, Abdul Rahman Munif, all. And then they chose story of Zahra. It was amazing. Nobody believed it. I didn't believe it. So this is how it is. They didn't publish it because they want propaganda or anything. It was very serious. Yeah, so because it, it, it did well, so the publishers, when a book does well, they say, oh, what about the second book? What about the third book? And this is how it is. Sometimes, of course, I'm not saying that they are sometimes attracted, publishers are attracted to something, you know, like uh, a storm behind a book or a writer, but maybe they publish one book. They don't follow this writer to publish everything this writer uh, produces. Yeah. Okay. Jemima? So my, my question uh, is about like the cities, the role of the cities uh, in, mm -hmm. your, uh, in your novels or like in the Arabic literary imaginary. Uh, what's the role of cities in Arabic imaginary? Uh, and I mean, in each one, in this uh, novel, uh, in Ahalam Azizi, each one of the characters has like uh, his or her own London, right? They are walking in their own London. So I, I want to know what... Uh, what is like the Hanan al-Sheikh's London as well? Yeah. Uh, Hanan al-Sheikh London is 
mixing up huh, with the English people and discovering the city. For example, I found myself going to the um, all the touristic places, all all the touristic places. This is the first time when I was for the first month in London. But then I said, I don't care. Really, I don't care. So I started talking to English people, people I don't know. I'll stop sometimes people and, uh, and I talk. And, uh, and then the, um, I was fascinated with the speaker's corner when you go and you hear people discussing politics, discussing social uh, things, um, random, random people. And, uh, but Hanan Sheh loves uh, other writers. I love to talk and have dialogue with other writers with, uh, in a way it is like other culture. And at the same time, I would go where all the Arabs are, all the small communities for the, let's say, the Caribbeans, the, uh, the Yemenis, the whatever. I'll go, the Africans, and then I'll go and see how they live because I'm very interested how a city could reflect itself on these communities. Do they, does the city change them or do they change the city? Yeah, this is interesting, yeah. Yeah. And this is how I become so interested to go and, and see around and study personalities and people and, uh, and through the theaters as well, through music, through food, markets, everything. Yeah. And it is, for example, I remember the first uh, book I read, it's called Detect in English, Detective, Emil and the Detective in School. So in a way, I wanted to know where did Emil live, <laughs> and this is just curiosity to to know the old English and the contemporary English, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. Uh, you said, Helen, that you like to talk to other writers. We have a question here from Safa Jubran. Uh, she's a, a very famous translator from nice. Brazil from Arabic to Portuguese, yes. and uh, and she she asked uh, if you read in Arabic or in English, and what you are reading now. Okay, I'm reading a very very interesting book. Um, it is by a Kuwaiti writer. I haven't heard of her before. Um, uh, she wrote she wrote it in English I forgot the name, the title of the book <laughs> but her name is May and Naqib I could go and get the book and <laughs> from my bedroom I'm, I'm really liking it liking it very much because it's about Kuwait and about a woman, a teacher, who says something about God and uh, like blasphemy or something. She didn't mean it. She was explaining something. And then one student taped her and uh, she, the, the police came to talk to her and things like that. So I thought it is a very courageous book. To, uh, to write and it is beautifully written and uh, yeah this is what I'm reading shall I go and get the book and tell you the, uh, the name of it or maybe I could find it here hold on yeah okay uh, uh, no not, not this <laughs> um, maybe there is Maybe it's here. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, I own. Yeah, tell me, tell me, Hannah. Yeah. No, I I always um, 
like to read between, when I'm writing, I can't read. I'm very scared that I'll get, I'll steal others' ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the writers. Uh, sorry, huh? No, no worry, no, no problem. Hmm. How come I don't know it? Uh, never mind. Okay. You have another question or? Nima, do you want to to make another question? Do you have any other question or? Yeah, my question is like if Hanan has this authors that inspire her, some authors that she always reads, she always come back. Or no, you just like read new things and random things. I mean, just a matter of curiosity. I mean, no, I, I tell you, I have so many writers I admire. Mm -hmm. So many writers. I mean, it will take ages to finish them. <laughs> so many, so many writers that I do admire. I, I started actually with Anais Nin. Have you heard of her? No, no. Listening. with her, uh, she was a French writer who befriended uh, Henry Miller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were living in uh, France. Uh, she met him in France and she wrote like eight books about what she did in France. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I started then be, became so interested in all uh, I'm sorry I can't get the uh, name maybe Roger do you want to talk to them one second one second yeah que a gente está em casa Sim, em casa com Hanana Sheikh. É. <risos> oh, que bom, Mari, muito bom. Pessoal, é só lembrando que é quem ainda não está inscrito no, no canal da Tabla, pode se inscrever para acompanhar as próximas é, conversas, né? Também é, se inscrever no nosso site, se quiser receber a newsletter com mais informações e, uh, dos lançamentos, dos livros, e também seguir a Tabla no Instagram, né? Então, lá sempre tem todas as novidades dos livros da, da Tabla. Ai, Ai, Great. Can you see Can it? Ah, I'm lasting home. And I'm lasting home. Aha, uh -huh. it's great. Yeah. And by also... Mary and Naqib, a Kuwaiti girl. Oh, Mary and, and she wrote it in English or English. it's a translation? Ah, English. English. And uh, what do you think about like this Arab authors writing uh, in English and French? Uh, what do you think about this literature? Yeah, why not? Because it depends, you know. Like she was, I'm sure when she was very young, she went to the States to finish her uh, studies. And I'm sure she was sent, for example, take my children. My children, they can't re uh, write um, Arabic very well. They write in English because we left Lebanon. And I'm sure this writer also left Kuwait very young and to study in the States. And then she, her English is better than, uh, than her Arabic. And the French, we have lots of Francophone in, yeah. in Lebanon. Yeah, like uh, many, many um, Lebanese writers, uh, and like Amin Malouf and uh, like yeah. Tahir Ben Jalloun in France and yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in your opinion, this is, uh, this literature is still Arab Arabic literature or uh, it's considered like a transnational or 
transnational and what they say he originally an arab originally lebanese originally whatever but for for me i'm always the lebanese the lebanese yeah. writer who lives in in the west because the- i only write in arabic only only one one book i had to write in english but i wrote in arabic first it is the um, about uh, the arabian nights i did a play yeah 1000 and one night i did a play with a uh, british uh, play uh, british director and i wrote uh, 19 stories uh, from 1000 and one night but i changed a lot and i put my stories with yeah. my stories i changed the, the, the stories and the, the, the director will say is this shahrazad or hanan <laughs> <laughs> i'll say both of us shahrazad and hanan yeah, yeah so I, one, the, hmm. talking about shahrazad i read somewhere that you at first hated shahrazad this yeah. is true Tell yeah. me, tell us. Yeah, I, about I, it. I, uh, I was very young and I said, why is she the prisoner of the Sultan? Why doesn't she kill him? <laughs> why does she have to poor woman day after night after night and not knowing if he's going to let her live or, or, or die? Why, why, why? No, no, she's so weak. I, I don't like her. But... Uh, But then, oh my God, when I started reading the Arabian Nights, it's unbelievable, mm-hmm. unbelievable. Six thousand pages I read. Oh, six thousand pages when I was preparing this play with the uh, the British uh, director. Yeah. And do you think there is like because it's my reading of Amira? Right? There is any relationship uh, between Amira and Shahrazad, the way like Amira uh, creates like I stories didn't... to survive, like in London. Well, uh, you are drawing my attention to it. Maybe subconsciously, this is what I thought, but not consciously. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah, because for me, she is like when I read for the first time, I felt like. Oh, I found like the Shahrazad in this book because she's always able to tell stories. I mean, she's always telling stories to survive London. Do you uh, know that Amira existed? Oh, really? Believe me. I saw her only once. Oh. Yeah. yeah. And she was living in London. Yeah. Yeah. She would she would do she pretends to be a uh, a princess while she was a prostitute. Oh, my God. And she knew Samir. Oh yeah. wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because, yeah. Samir was the one who told me about her. And he said, "Yes, you can see her. Uh, he said you should write about her too, but on one condition. I'll go to a coffee shop, I'll be sitting, and then you pretend you don't know me, and then uh, she will she will be there or she will come and talk to me to him." I mm-hmm. said, Okay, and she came, the Rolls Royce, and uh, pretending to be a princess. The yeah. Rolls Royce, oh, it's amazing, 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 because the way the way the stories are yeah. depicted, it's really real. Uh, yeah. When I went, when I read for the first time, I went to London, mm-hmm. and I just realized that the Edgware Road that is in the book, it's the real. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it's exactly I, yeah. the same place. You know, one one coffee shop, they knew I was doing something. Oh, really? Knew, yeah. So it is. It was so funny. I sat. Usually they say, "Hello, madam. What do you like to have?" That day, nobody welcomed me, and I. Yeah, there was a, a waiter. I t- start talking to him. He did this to me. Uh-huh. As if they're telling me they told me not to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's amazing. I mean, the map uh, you wrote in the book. I mean, we can see clearly London there. 
that's why I saw like this is a character here because <laughs> we have like the map, the Edra Row, Marble Art, and then Oxford Street. I mean, it's everything there. I mean, so congratulations. It's oh, thank you so much. Thank you. So when you come, any of you to London to visit, please contact me. Of course. I'll show you my London. Of course. <laughs> Hanan, we, I think that's uh, pretty late, no? Good. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I would like to, to thank you again. Yeah, for... it was a pleasure. I mean, we, we had lovely time, three of us. For this, yeah, for this uh, conversation, it was, it was great to... I am to... the third one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Hanan. It was a pleasure to have this conversation. I mean, it's my first uh, translation, my first book. So it's really, really amazing being here and talking to you, Hanan. And I hope we meet in your London soon. Yes. If you need anything, I'm here to answer any anything. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you a lot. Thank you a lot. Okay, e... bye. E para todo mundo que está aí, obrigado pela audiência, pela, pela participação.